So um, <clears throat> there's a there's an issue with with everything I've said so far. And that is, uh, you know, originally I I said that we would like to have these curved tiles because they would add elastic energy to the structure and maybe bias the structure. But of course, um, we have no idea. Take one of those uh, origamis with curved tiles that I constructed. We have no idea that it's stable or that, it, you know, maybe maybe if you let go, it just comes back to the flat state. Maybe it gets stuck in a local minimizer. Um, and, you know, if we wanted to, to really have it in that state, you know, which boundary conditions should we choose? Should we do something with the creases? Should we, you know, somehow apply boundary conditions to the creases? Should we make the creases much stiffer than the uh, tiles? There's just many, many questions. So in other words, what I've done is, is I've not solved any boundary value problem, any ener energy minimization problem, I've just done kinematics. So that's, that's wide open, you know, and the, the whole subject is wide open from a mathematical viewpoint, at least in this Lagrangian framework that I'm doing, which is would be the framework you would want to use if you didn't want to use energy. So, um, I mean, um, uh, was, you know, so I want to talk a little bit about how you would calculate the energy and how you would get started. But basically, I mean, the, the short answer to this last last part of my le my lecture series is that you know um, we don't need you know we, we need mathematical work to say what is a well posed problem. So that's a completely wide open area. I would say there's almost almost nothing known. Um, and uh, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, Kirchhoff's plane theory. That's a, a theory for thin sheets that one might use to make these origami structures. It's so-called geometrically nonlinear. So it uh, gives accurate answers, even if you, you know, bend the paper with large deformations. You know, so it's not, it has a, the look of linear elasticity, but it's uh, geometrically nonlinear. So it will give you an accurate answer. You can take this piece of paper and bend it in half. Um, whereas, it, you know, so I don't know if you know that difference between linear elasticity and nonlinear elasticity. It's they're very, very different theories. And um, the, the nonlinear elasticity is geometrically nonlinear in the sense that, um, well, if you have a, a piece of material which with zero stress and you you give it a large rotation, a pure rotation, it still has zero stress. Linear elasticity does not have that property. If you if you if you take a um, if you, if you, it depends exactly what you do, of course. If you, if you would in linear elasticity, you would calculate the um, you would calculate the strain by taking the symmetric part of the displacement gradient, so one half grad u plus grad u plus, and um, and so if 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 you took u u is the displacement, if you took u to be a, a perfect rotation, an exact rigid rotation. Um, now, of course, if this has got zero stress and you give it an exact rigid rotation, it should have zero stress after. But it does not, according to linear elasticity, if you, if you take the displacement corresponding to an exact rigid rotation. In fact, uh, you know, there's a, um, there's a nice exercise. You take, um, you take a piece of steel and you take linear elasticity and, and, and you, you give it in linear elasticity. So you take the, the moduli, the, the measured elastic moduli for steel, and you, you, and you rotate it. And as I just said, when you rotate it, it you predict a non-zero stress if you give it an exact rotation, not an approximate rotation, but an exact rotation. So you can ask the question, how much rotation do I have to do, do I have to do so that the stress is let's say 10% of the yield stress in steel. So that would be that would be a the yield stress in steel is quite large. So it, that would be a quite quite drastic error. It should have no stress 
uh, it's predicted to have 10% of the yield stress in steel. So how much, how much do you have to rotate this to get 10% of the yield stress? It's about a degree. So that shows how bad linear elasticity is. But anyway, this uh, Kirchhoff's rod theory is geometrically nonlinear, so it handles those large rotations. Um, and uh, uh, and there's a there's a uh, an ex so the the the, the version of nonlinear elasticity, let's say that's that you would apply to a thin body would be Kirchhoff's plate theory, and um, there's rigorous derivations of that. To, references there, and I know many people in this room also worked on this topic and various um, various implications and uh, extensions, and you know, we really understand a lot about this, this, this topic at this point. Um, so I uh, just present uh, the, the, the gamma convergence, All right. it, so, so as I mentioned, it can be, there's a gamma convergence result, which uh, in which you obtain exactly this Kirchhoff plate theory from three-dimensional nonlinear elasticity under very weak assumptions. And it, it goes like this. You, um, it's just standard gamma convergence. So first you divide by the thickness of the plate. It's also been extended to shell theory so that your reference domain, the stress-free domain, could be curved. Um, but anyway, this is the case where the reference domain is flat. You divide by the thickness of the sheet and uh, then there's uh, an onslaught's free lower bound. There's a lower bound. And then there's a sequence which obtains asymptotically the lower bound. And uh, the limiting functional is, is, is the function of Kirchhoff's plate theory. So that's a rigorous derivation of Kirchhoff's plate theory. And you see, which is here. And uh, Q2 is a quadratic form. Two, this two is a second fundamental form. And um, um, uh, and you see that it's in this this function space A. Oh, I hope I need to find. Oh, there's A. Yeah, is isometric mappings. You can see it's S is the domain a domain in R two. So it's the origami before folding, <laughs> and uh, you can see the that it's isometric mappings because y comma one and y comma two are unit vectors and y comma one. Uh, I come to zero. And uh, you take the second fundamental form, which is listed here, and you, you put it in there. And this, this is a highly accurate way to calculate the energy of a thin sheet. Let's say. The quadratic form Q, so there's a quadratic form related to linear elasticity. Um, so you, again, you might be confused because the result is that you only need to know the energy of linear elasticity to calculate Q2, but it's but the theory is geometrically nonlinear, so it handles those large rotations correctly. So, um, um, and the way you get this Q2, Q3 is the is the ordinary en uh, energy density for linear elasticity. It's obtained in this way, where W is the energy of nonlinear elasticity, and it's, so it's. The second derivative is calculated at the identity, so it's a quadratic form, and it would have a particular form. This would, with this would become very special if you considered an isotropic material, and then it would be, um, then it would be, there would be two constants, only two constants here, which could be taken to be Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. Okay, so in any case, uh, if you take this Q3 and you minimize out this C, then you get. Uh, Q2, and that's that's the energy density of the Kirchhoff theory. Um, now, at the beginning, okay, there was a, in, in case there was something not clear here, there was chain burns getting the divide by the thickness. So, um, so uh, <clears throat> it, in fact, this is the energy in, uh, this is the explicit form of the energy of Kirchhoff's plate theory. So this is this is just the, the that's exactly what I just said. It's just this energy with the Q2 specialized to an isotropic material. There it is right there. And um, these two constants, lambda and mu, are elastic moduli. Um, so they're called the Lame moduli. And there are also two other 
or maybe more familiar moduli that are that are can be obtained normally with uh, inequalities that are usually assumed. They're invertible functions of lambda mu. Those would be Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. Uh, and then there's the thickness cubed is it sits out front. So that's a very reasonable way for an origami to calculate this uh, the the energy of these sheets and. Uh, and it's conveniently defined only for isometries. It gives you infinite energy for, which, for something which is not an isometry. Um, so it's, um, and um, so what I, what I want to show you is that it also specializes quite nicely to this Lagrangian formulation that we're discussing here. So um, in particular, the reference domain and the reference rulings become a, a, an important way to parameterize that. So um, the second fundamental form is actually E perpendicular. So E is a, just as, as throughout my talk, so E was a, in the reference domain, it was defined the reference rulings, which were the pre-image of the rulings in the deformed configuration. So E perp is, is here, so it's defined on the whole domain. You can think of one side of the crease, or analyzing one side of the crease. And the second fundamental form is can be written this way. Mm -hmm. but yeah. The tedious description there was this notion of the original curve and then the deformed curve. Right. And that was the data. Right. The rules. So you're pulling back into the rulings to the reference. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You must control that. That's not a degree of freedom. Right. I mean, uh, given given an isometric uh, mapping with enough smoothness, you know, you 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 can do that. You know, yeah. Under the assumptions, I mean. You can have the rulings in the deformed configuration cross and various things like that. So you have to, yeah. So, yeah. I, I, so maybe I should have written the assumptions again, but that was on one of those very early slides, those, those assumptions. So anyway, it's a, it's, it's a symmetric matrix, which uh, has this nice form in terms of E perp. So E perp is defined on the whole domain. And um, and uh, the energy is can can simply be written this way. So this is a, when you write it this way, it looks like you know these two terms would be separate, um, but actually they they can be combined. And it's, it's simply this capital lambda squared and this coefficient in the second fundamental form um, times a modulus e. That's Usually, use people would use E for Young's modulus, but it's the plate modulus. It's uh, it's it's this modulus in terms of the Lame module. It's not Young's modulus in particular. So, modulus, and actually, from a practical viewpoint, that that has a, that has huge implications. The fact that that the that the the modulus comes out as a factor because it allows you to do something that you can never do with elasticity and that is do scaling. So um, if you, you know how people in fluid mechanics do scaling, they, 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 the Reynolds number comes from a scaling analysis and it's, a, it's an analysis uh, from a mathematical point of view, you, you try to change variables in the differential equation in such a way that you get back the number of Stokes equations. So that's the general point of view. But, a much more special point of view is you, it's invariance of the equation under a change of units. But the general point of view is you change variables in the equation. And this, this linearity in the modulus speed here means that there's a whole bunch of new scaling laws you can do if you're, for example, you want to take one of these origamis and put it inside <laughs> Navier-Stokes fluid and you want to do scaling. You want to build a wind tunnel model for this. You, you can do it. There's new scaling. There's a tremendous scaling with interesting scaling with the modulus here. Um, now, um, <clears throat> another thing about this Kirchhoff theory, which is which is uh, interesting, if you take this Lagrangian viewpoint and you pull back these uh, rulings to the reference domain, is the following. So, so here's a formula. Here's the Here's the description of the, these white lines, the rulings in the reference domain. Um, so S is uh, arc length parameter. Use the arc length parameter along the crease. 
to, to specify the E and you use the, then that's the crease itself. And you have some domain that, you know, V is a parameter along the white line. And so you, so what I want to do is simply change to ruling coordinates in the Kirchhoff energy. And, um, and you can write the second fundamental form in this way, you have this lambda squared. Of course, when you change variables, there's a Jacobian, and you can work out the Jacobian as x prime dot e perpendicular. And uh, and in the end, you can write. In fact, you can you can integrate because because this uh, expression is linear in the v. You can integrate out the v. And so, actually, Kirchhoff's Kirchhoff's flight theory can be written as a one-dimensional integral. Um, when you in these rulings, very useful, uh, very useful thing for for doing calculations. So, um, so here's an example. Uh, so now we have a way of calculating the energy, and so um, let's see. So that would be the first step: is have some way of calculating the energy. You can also think about calculating stresses and moments and tractions and all these mechanical quantities that come from energy, but. Um, I think um, you know people here will be most interested in what the energy is, and so it has this very simple. Um, so I, I took an example here. Um, so this is um, this is a particular isometric mapping, um, and it has a curvature and tor torsion. Actually, the cap is the curvature, and tau is the torsion, as you might expect. And um, and here's uh, some origami design. So this particular, I just wanted to see, you know, what would be the energy of a particular design. So the reference state is a flat sheet with these two regions here, and the deformed state is is something curved. It's like a circular thing here, a circular like V. And um, and here's a pathway to, in which. You go from this day to this day, but you do it in such a way that the tile is zero. And this is another pathway that gets you this same state, but it has torsion, as, as you can kind of see here in this pathway. And, uh, and as we we in this particular family of deformations, you can you can plot the energy versus the, the torsion and the curvature. Those are the torsion and the curvature of the crease. Um, and uh, so that's a nice parameter so you can use. And you see for those two pathways, you know, the second pathway has completely different energy. And you can also see these surfaces are, they have singularities and there's a lot of interesting things to look at with regard to the energy of these, these structures. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so this is the big the big question then would be is um, you know allowing for you know so what's missing is existence theorems, right? I mean we, we you know with certain boundary conditions and and uh, you know to know something is actually well posed and wants to have any of those pictures that I did with the isometric mappings, right? It's completely missing <laughs> in this area. Um, so, uh, you know, or you could write, say it this way, allowing for possible boundary conditions or constraints on creases. So we don't know how to pose a well-posed problem, you know, and, and you can imagine, um, you know, one, one way to make a crease, and this is a, a way that a guy, Sergio Pellegrino, who's a structural mechanics guy, um, has made creases, you know, is, is you, you have a wire, and wires are approximately undergo isometric deformations uh, or, or as, as curves. Um, and so the, the relevant theory in that case would be, could be euler bernoulli theory, that's a theory for wires, or Kirchhoff's rod theory, also based on isometric deformations of wires. So he makes wires and then he puts little hinges on them. But one could make a stiff wire and uh, have it much stiffer than the material of the uh, of the isometric deformations of the of the tiles, and 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 then and that that could be a boundary condition. So one could imagine situations where where the crease would be impose a boundary condition. You know, but I mean, I you know, it's it's wide open as I say, wide open uh, trying to understand how you really actually bias a structure to to have one of the configurations I've I've been showing.
Um, yeah, so it's uh, that's true. And so um, it's an interesting thing. I mean, can you can you look at experiments and try to get some you know some idea of what would be a well posed problem in case it's been, there are curved tiles in, in that kind of experiment? And there there are some really old experiments, but but uh, very fascinating experiments that many people have looked at, and there's really no understanding of the, these experiments. They're, um, they're this experiment, you can you can actually do it with a Coke can. Um, you take a Coca-Cola can, and you put what's called a mandrel inside. You, you put a cylinder of steel, a stiff, stiff cylinder inside, and then you push down on the top. You try to buckle this, uh, Coca-Cola can, and um, it does something amazing. It, it, it makes these patterns. Um, it's it, it's not understood why it makes those patterns, um, and um, and people have noticed that they're kind of similar to patterns um, that, in fact, it's most often um, compared to this Yoshimura pattern as, as being you know looking something like uh, the buckling pattern of of a cylindrical shell. Of course, when we saw this, we said, well, at least at the level of test functions, we can do much better, <laughs> you know, and we can make a curved dial. So this is made with the methods I've been showing you at the, these lectures. And this, uh, you know, there's a kind of some kind of reasonable, or at least better than the ocean mirror pattern, uh, agreement between this shape and the shape. So, so maybe this is a possible way to think in terms of uh, uh, a real problem, you know, not just kinematics. The yeah, there's the energy. Oh, uh, no, I mean, uh, uh, well, the Yoshimir pattern, it would be zero energy because it's just rigid rotations of tiles. Uh, unless you put an energy for the crease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, no, I didn't do that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, one could use one with the energy for the crease that depended on the angle. Yeah, that's right. And then your approximation is better in a sense, not just with the resemblance, but it's really right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a that would be a simple calculation that would be very reasonable to do. Yeah. And the bigger issue is what's, you know, is that potentially a solution of some kind of problem, you know, some kind of mathematical problem, which necessarily if you don't put the mandrel in. You don't put the cylinder inside. <laughs> it doesn't give you this pattern. It just buckles in a much more uh, random and uh, with big, big regions and no kind of thing like this. But this is a pretty interesting pattern anyway to try to, to look at. And uh, anyway, it's very easy using this. These are calculations with Kirchhoff theory. It's very easy to calculate the energy of, the, of this of this kind of time, this kind of tile or, or something that's even more close to this case. And so you have your Shimura pattern from the from the What's that? You have your Shimura pattern. Well, this is called generalized. This that's uh, my student Wan Yu, Wan Yu. She uh, she called it generalized Yoshimura pattern. I don't know why she did that. It's not that close to this thing, but <laughs> that's what she did. <laughs> um, uh, and that's another interesting case. I uh, we can only get a, a very very rough picture in an old old paper of crushing a, a cone, and um, that's interesting because that also I think there's also a mandrel inside inside here, but it's, cones are extremely different difficult to crush. They're, they're used in construction because of that, and um, and if you look at this pattern, it's also quite similar to uh, to a curved tile origami pattern. So it's potentially Actually, uh, you know, what does that mean? It means, in mathematical terms, it's a test function. You know, <laughs> there is an optimum angle for making it. <laughs> well, that is it. Could it difficult to crush? So is there an optimum angle? Yeah, there might be. Uh, there, there might be stuff known. Uh, there, there's a literature certainly. You know, people did many tests. There's many empirical tests. Much more on the cylinder than there is on the cone, because we could only find this this one paper. And, I'll tell you a little bit more. Uh, I, uh, but I also want to tell you about something else. Uh, here's, here's, a, here's something, some answer or some relation to your question. 
is um, this is a this is a more complex material than just a sheet. So, and there's a theory for this actually. And it's, uh, a lot of people work on this. Uh, it's, uh, goes back to um, this theory goes back to Mark Warner and Eugene Terentiev at the uh, Cavendish Lab at Cambridge. And um, so they they have a theory for this kind of material. It has a uh, it has these little um, uh, you know, molecules, elongated molecules. So it's a, it's like a liquid crystal. It's, it's like a solid crystal with the liquid crystal structure. Um, and and it turns out you can you can actually using light you can write you can write into the material the direction of these uh, of these uh, elongated molecules. So, uh, in fact, in, in this, they, they've been written in here in, in this kind of pattern. But then there's a kind of a, you know, they come together at some point, and the point where they come together is uh, straight lines. So, there's, so this has been patterned according to this pattern with the center here corresponding to the center there. Mm -hmm. And there's a discontinuity at this, at this edge right there. Um, and um, so, but it is a thin sheet. Um, you know, so there's, there's, there it is right there. There's the sheet, you know, and this is, a, I think, a theoretic, might be a theoretical picture. Anyway, the actual sheet that's been patterned is here, and it's a thin sheet. Um, as I say, it's not governed by Kirchhoff, but it's governed by something, some generalization of Kirchhoff. And um, it undergoes a phase transformation. It undergoes a phase transformation by, I think, it's shortening along the, along the axis. And, and fattening in a direction perpendicular to the axis. Okay. And because of that, um, if you pattern it like this and you raise the temperature from 25 to 125, it forms these wonderful cones. And, um, but it's still a very thin sheet. Um, and, and, and if you, if, if, if when, you, when you do this, you take this flat sheet and you put a weight on it, and and now you heat it up, it lifts the weight. And these guys in this paper notice that it has, I mean, they exaggerate, I mean, they don't exaggerate, but they explain it in this way, it lifts the load 147 times its weight and uh, with a stroke, you know, displacement of 3,000%. Mm -hmm. um, but still, it's pretty amazing that a thin sheet could do that, you know, so there's something very special about cones and and spheres, maybe, and maybe cylinders, and so on. Um, so, um, so that's that's an interesting um, subject. Whole subject in itself is is you know why are cones and spheres so rigid? And so, if you're a mathematician, you would immediately think of Nash Kuiper theorem, and you would think that um, you know this difference between C2 rigidity, I mean C1 rigidity and C2, I mean C2 rigidity and C1 flexibility, if you want to say, then, uh, you know, is that, you know, could that potentially be related to this buckling issue in, in this sphere? I don't, I don't know, but I think it's a very interesting thing to think about. So I'm going to list a bunch of things. I think they're all related. So to start with Nash Kuiper and the sphere. Um, Rigidity because you are talking about that. Yes. Which is defined from W2. Yes. For C2 rigidity, you have a C2, then automatically you know, convex. Convex. Yeah. The same is true also for the W2. Okay. Okay. So the the Kirchhoff theory that you presented before. Okay. Yeah. That's good. This Yeah. So that's. That's, yeah, that's even more important because we're talking about theory. That's the theory we believe is good. Yeah, yeah. so that's a good thing. Um, there's another, there's another, there, there, there are instabilities and elasticity that are, that I think are somehow related to this whole discussion. Um, it was originally Alan Gent did, did this. So he took a rubber sheet and he, and he bent it. Just bent it, and on the in, and it was transparent, so he could look through it quite easily in the bent shape. And he saw lines on the inside, and um, and those lines are um, 
are, um, you know, so there's a there's there's an instability. You take a rubber sheet, and the material kind of kind of it, it forms a kind of a, a kind of crease in a way um, at the line. So if you looked at a cross section of those lines, it, they would be shaped like a V going in. People have, people have measured this and so forth, looked at this. And, and the first thing people did is they did bifurcation theory, check you know whether this is a standard instability. Could this be described in the standard way, like Euler buckling or any other instability? And they found out it, it cannot. So there's a, even rigorous results that, that um, at, the, at, the, at the point of, at the bending in which these were first observed, there's, there's no bifurcation. So it's not, just, not given by bifurcation theory. Um, and so, so this, that's an that's a unso unresolved problem, is how, how, do you, how do you analyze this? But on the other hand, you know, these are, these, the, these deformations, they look like they're, um, you know, they look like they're, there are small deformations, but the but the tangent is quite far from the horizontal tangent. So it could be small in um, L infinity, but not small in W1 infinity or something like that. Um, so that would that that's one explanation for this thing. Here's a third thing. Um, so um, lots of people here do the direct method in the calculus of variations, but before the direct method, actually the direct method was invented by Tonelli around 19, 1920. He wrote two papers and uh, fabulous papers, but they were incredibly influential papers, even though I guess they don't get referenced very much. Tonelli, uh, Tonelli started the direct method. And ever since then, we all do the direct method. Even gamma convergence is the result of the direct method. But in the 19th century, there was, Another method of the calculus of variations meant a very different thing. It was a study of strong local minimizers and weak local minimizers. And fortunately, this, this is coming back because all this stuff is about local minimizers. And it's clear that, that weak, pro, local, weak local minimizers would be <laughs> local minimizers for, for the standard problem in the calculus of variations. Weak local minimizers would be local minimizers in W1 infinity and strong local minimizers would be local minimizers in L infinity, something like that. Um, so fortunately it's coming back and there's a few papers about this. So uh, the problem is we don't know the conditions for strong local minimizers in uh, vector value problems. So, um, well, I mean, okay, the, I guess the, the, the domain has to be um, you know, dimension greater than one, and the and the and the codomain has to be dimension greater than one as well. That's the case we don't know. So elasticity theory, we don't know. There's no there's no condition of strong local minimum. But strong local minimizers, I mean, to me, it's it's the most important subject in material science. I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's what material science instabilities are all about. They're all about strong local, minimizers. and we have no idea. Well, there are papers emerging. There's these papers. Uh, it turns out that quasi-convexity and quasi-convexity at the boundary, if you know those terms, they're they're very important to this uh, what's what's emerging. And so and there's you know, some some really, really quite interesting papers. But yeah, papers maybe starting with this one and then Peter Cordero's thesis and some other papers and the quasi convexity at the boundary plays a role, so I put all my marks in there. And so, um, you know, it, it, you know we, we're beginning to have conditions for um, a um, L infinity local minimizer, but they're not verifiable. <laughs> we don't even, no problem has been solved, you know, because they're not verifiable. So, this is a that's, that's an interesting area. So the question is that related to, to these things? Certainly related to lots of problems in material science. Is it related to this? 
And then there's a topic from structural mechanics called imperfection sensitivity. And these, this, uh, you know, if you're interested in this subject, yeah. even from a mathematical point of view, it's very much looking, we're looking at what people have done experimentally. And these pictures come from this, this land. And, uh, and there's a lot of information. So imperfection sensitivity is that, uh, you know, there's a, there's a bifurcation by standard analysis. At, at, you, you write a bifurcation diagram. There's a bifurcation, think of a load in, in these problems. There's a bifurcation at some load. But the, as soon as there's a bifurcation, the load drops off to maybe one third its value. And it's not to be, it's not to be due to, uh, um, you know, related to imperfections in the material. So um, and there's a whole there's a whole bunch of experiments. Some of them are summarized here about imperfection sensitivity. So it 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 does have to do with local minimizers. It has to do with probably strong local minimizers and so forth. So I think all of these topics are related. <laughs> They're all sort of similar, right? They all deal with this, uh, you know, C1 versus C2 or W1 infinity versus L infinity. And, um, and probably the understanding of why cones and spheres are so rigid are is coming from these, these issues. So I have nothing really to add to this, but I, I do think it's really important to um, is to solve some problem in calculus of variations for, for strong local minimums and a decent vector value problem. So we begin to understand what are the conditions, you know, what beyond the uh, conditions. Okay, so now I want to switch, you know, end my lectures. So, um, so, you know, we were having a lot of fun, as you can imagine, um, constructing all these things. And But you construct all these things and you have no idea what they'll look like in the end, and you see some pretty shapes. And you, but you say, you know, we should use this for something. So we should design something real with... Uh, with this origami design uh, methods, where the methods are developed. So uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about one applications we've been considering. And in, you know, whenever you do an application, you can't be method driven because you, you'll fail if you're method driven. So you start off using origami design methods. Maybe in the end you don't use origami design methods because you find a different way to do it much better. <laughs> so anyway, we looked at these, and we we in fact we looked. We looked at the slide, this very slide, and we said, you know, they look like, they look like turbines, they look like these propellers and so forth. You know, what, what can we design? So we, um, we decided that we would try to design a vertical axis wind turbine. Okay. So you know, especially in Germany, you know about the horizontal axis wind turbines. That's, that's these. But there's also something called vertical axis wind turbines. So like this and, and like these pictures. And there are two kinds, Savonius and Darius. Um, and um, you know, people have, people have in, invented these or they tried to discover these because people don't want a horizontal axis wind turbine in their backyard. They would much prefer to have something small but very effective. Maybe the vertical axis wind turbine you could put in an urban area or suburban area or an exurban area, or maybe on a farm. <laughs> in the US, we have those people on farms that uh, don't like to be connected to the grid, you know, and so <laughs> might uh, be useful for those people. Anyway, so we decided to think about that. Now, now there's two kinds, as I said, and, and everyone knows, so it's a completely failed technology. Right? So nobody, there are, you can, I have vertical axis wind turbine. Basically, it's a failed technology. Um, and everybody knows why it's failed. Um, uh, so the <laughs> longest uh, wind turbines, they, they work on drag, you know, so the, the wind comes and it, it pushes against this. I don't know if you if you do sailing, but or if you've seen the America's Cup or one of these sailing races, mm -hmm. you'll notice there's two kinds of sails. There's the big sail that goes out the front, that's the spinnaker. And then there's the sail, the more traditional sail, shaped like a triangle, and that's the mainsail. The mainsail generates force 
a force on the boat by um, by the fact that it's like a um, an airfoil. So it uh, uses lift of an airfoil, and the spinnaker uses drag. It, it's it, the wind just pushes against the, the the spinnaker, and then it spills out the side, and it's changing its momentum. So momentum is, is transferred as a force to the so uh, Savonius work on drag and Darius work on on uh, like an airfoil. Work on lift, and these work on track. And so everybody knows, in either case, why they fail. They fail because the wind, you know, this, this side catches the wind and, and starts to make a turn. But so there's the parasitic side, there's the other side. <laughs> and the other side is fighting, you know, and it's just not a very efficient way to make a vertical axis wind turn. So we said, okay, maybe we can. You know, look at these shapes, they're like origami designs, maybe we can come up with some better design. So the first thing we did was we decided we would make uh, deformable, since we're like these isometric mappings, we would make deformable shapes. So this is deformable here. So that when it comes on the back side, it collapses toward the center. And you lose a bit of this effect of having the parasitic side. You, you, you minimize it at the parasitic side. So we did some calculations and we also did some simulations, which are not trivial because it's a rotating thing and it's not standard. Um, and we really like to see this, um, this wake to be non-symmetric because that's an indication that we're getting, uh, we're getting some significant torque and we actually simulated the torque and so forth. So anyway, we, this, this, we played around with this for a while. And then after a while, we realized, well, maybe we can do much better than this. And so it still has some origami parts, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different um, different design. So it has some origami blades. You, and it, you would use some Kirchhoff's plate theory to, to design those blades. Um, but it's not as somehow central as the other, the other case. They're just stationary. They don't, they don't deform. Um, so there, are, in this case, there are two axes, and in this picture, you're looking down the, down these, down these. You're looking from the top here, and there, are, these two axes are counter rotating. So this one is rotating like this. This one is rotating like this. And um, and the wind is coming from. If you look, and there's also this deflector here. This deflector is designed um, to, um, you know. Tries to win away from the parasitic side. That's uh, the obvious way is to just put something in its way. And actually, the design of this is, is a very important part. And this is not, there's a, there's a much better, this, the shape is not particularly good. But anyway, it's just a picture. And now you see that when it's turning, this, this blade is acting like an airflow. And then as it continues turning, this blade begins to act like a spinnaker. And even if you follow the wind here you, from the simulation, which I, I'm not showing you, then, then this actually, even way back here, it's getting quite a bit of torque from the, from the, um, from the spinnaker effect, if you want to say. And similarly, similarly over here, this is kind of rotating this way. And, um, and uh, similarly, this, you know, this, you remove this parasitic side and you get quite a bit of and uh, a little bit later in time, this blade too, like it was here, it's rotating in this direction. A little bit later, now this is acting like a mainsail, and this is acting like a spinnaker. And the blade one, which was acting like a mainsail before, is now acting like a spinnaker, and this is substantial. So anyway, it's uh, actually works. It seems to work so far quite well. So anyway, I I thought I would. Uh, well, in a, it's a practical application. And, 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 and otherwise, I finishes my lectures. <laughs>